Hey, what's up everyone? It's your buddy Matt here. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're at the third installment of the Super 370 restoration video. That's right, the 1968 Skidoo Super Olympic with the 370 engine. Uh, in the previous videos, we pulled the engine out of the machine. We ended up taking the top end off. It started looking at what was wrong with it. In this video, we're gonna start miking, that is take the measurements of the pistons and cylinders to make sure that they're still in usable condition. So if you like working on old snowmobiles, if you like working on old engines, if you like wasting your time with me, then stick around. All right, so we're gonna begin with the measurement of the pistons and cylinders. But before we start with that, um, what do you suppose would happen if I was to do this? All right, what goes with what? We're all messed up, right? Wrong, because I took the time to properly identify all my parts. Observe, I added the head gasket and the needle cage bearing together with this little tie wrap, and I indicated that it was on the carb cylinder. Uh, I also said rear, even though it's not very legible. And I put this little dot. I'll tell you what that dot means in a couple seconds. Did the same thing over here. This is the front cylinder. So I can't get these parts mixed up. Normally when you rebuild an engine, you'll put brand new head gaskets, so it doesn't really matter. But, you know, we'll put the needle cage bearings back where they go in their, in their respective connecting rods. So let's put these guys aside. Now, if I look at this cylinder head, Versus this one, you can't see very much of a difference. However, there is one that is very subtle. If you look right over here, you can see an infinitesimally small punch mark. Can you see it right there? So I used a center punch and I made a little punch, not on the mating surface, but just on the fin. Uh, and I put one little punch mark on this guy and no punch mark on this guy. You guys see where I'm going with this? Now if you look at this one over here, the famous carb kit, I put a little dot, that kind of indicates the punch mark. So these two are a matching set. This goes over here. Now what about these pistons? Look at this guy right over here. Right over here, inconspicuously, a single punch mark. So we know that this guy goes with this right over here. What if we take a look at the cylinder now? Scan around this guy. Hmm, don't see any punch marks on it. What about this one over here? Mm, there it is. So we know that this ultimately goes together and this ultimately goes together. No matter how I did my little sleight of hand, this is how my kit goes. I recommend you do the same whenever you take apart something so you can put it back together exactly the way it was. Okay, so moving on to measurements, you don't need to have extremely expensive tools to take basic measurements of high precision parts. You can't use a ruler, you can't use a tape measure. However, this tool is not very expensive, especially one that isn't digital. Uh, this is a vernier caliper, and we use this to measure uh, inside and outside diameters on a precision scale. This one is metric and imperial, and you have a whole bunch of different options at different price points. If you wanna measure internal and external uh, diameters, you can get a kit of these. I guess we'll call these, I don't know, calipers as well. Uh, I paid under $10 for three of these. I don't know where the third one is, but uh, this is the one that you would use for internal measurements. If you can imagine opening this up over here, bringing it in and measuring the inside like so, taking it out and then taking your precision measuring device and then measuring the tip to tip to get the exact internal bore or the internal dimension. If you want to do, for example, the piston, do the same thing, adjust this little thumb screw in order to get your dimension. Once you have it fixed, you can take the internal measurement section and come in and measure exactly what that is. If you have a little bit more money and you want to have something even more precise, 
you can go ahead and get a kit of uh, bore gauges like this. Basically, you have this little bore gauge over here that you can adjust, and that'll give you a measurement. Then you have these little extension rods. Unscrew one of these ends, put the extension rod on it, and then with this little holder, you basically hold this guy here. As you plunge it into your bore and take a measurement directly off the scale. We're going to use a technique that's called go no go. Basically what that means is I don't really care what the measurements of the piston and the cylinder are. All I know is that I want to be within a certain clearance. Let's say for example that this is a stock piston and we know that it's supposed to be 62 millimeters in external diameter. Now we also know that as you machine something, say at the factory, there is a certain tolerance. So you won't find a piston that's exactly 62 millimeters. It might be a couple thou over, it might be a couple thou under. Usually very precise, but you never really know. The same goes for your cylinder bore. In theory, if you had a slightly oversized piston, say at the factory when you're assembling these engines, you would try to find a slightly oversized cylinder and match those two together in order to have a proper clearance. I believe that for this engine, we're supposed to be between three and six thou or four and six thou. Basically, because this engine is not brand new, our upper wear limit is six thou. That means that the difference between the outer diameter of my piston and the inner diameter of my cylinder can't be more than six thousandths of an inch. I don't know what that is in metric. Now I know what you're thinking. If you've ever taken apart a piston and a cylinder, you notice that the wear is not equal everywhere. Most of the time you'll have more wear on, let's call it, I don't know, the front and back of the piston uh, than you would on the sides. That also goes for the fact that you would have more wear on your skirt than you would up here at the top where it's properly supported more by the rings. You know, the rings are the ones that are getting all the friction. However, as this guy kind of wobbles around in that cylinder, it can go ahead and wear. So you would expect to have the maximum amount of wear maybe here at the bottom and then the least amount of wear maybe up here on the sides between this point and that point. So that's why we don't only take one measurement. We can take several. Behold! A lovely drawing that I just made you. So if you look at, let's say for example, the piston as I drew over here, we're going to want to take a measurement in two directions, let's say front to back and side to side, and at two locations, top and bottom. Now in my drawing, I really make it as if it's really at the absolute top and the absolute bottom. In reality, we're going to go slightly below, so between this top ring and the crown of the piston, and we're going to go slightly above the bottom, let's say maybe half an inch, and we'll take the measurements there, and we'll transcribe them into my little chart. The same will be done for our cylinder wall. We're going to take our measurements perhaps half an inch from the top and half an inch from the bottom, one measurement front to back and one measurement left to right. We've identified all these as T1 is our front to back top measurement, T2 is our side to side top, B1 and B2 are the bottom front uh, to rear and side to side measurements. It's going to be the same for both the cylinder and the piston so we keep our, our identical nomenclature and we come and we inscribe them once again into the cylinder table. At which point we will then subtract the piston measurement from the cylinder measurement in order to get our clearance. The clearance is basically the gap in between the piston and the cylinder. And we'll have four clearance measurements. And I'm not sure yet whether or not I'm going to average them out and say that's okay. Basically stating that if one of them is outside of spec, but the other three are within spec and my average gives me something that's below six thou, I'm probably going to go ahead and rebuild this engine. In all fairness, I'm probably going to be rebuilding this engine with these used parts, regardless of what I get in terms of measurements. Okay, so before I go any further, I just want to mention that this is not going to be a video on how to actually read, especially these old school um, non-digital uh, gauges. 
neither of them, not this one, not this one. I'm just going to be calling out measurements. I know how to read them. If you want to find out how to do that, I mean, there's probably about a million videos online on how to do it. We're not going to do that here. When I mentioned before the go, no go method, um, I can't just take the 62 millimeter hypothetical piston diameter because we don't know whether or not our piston is actually 62 millimeters. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and measure with our vernier caliper over here. I'm just going to take a quick measurement. Just, I guess we'll call this our B1 measurement uh, real quick. Take it over here. Okay. And I have, I already measured it. That's why I'm fast at it. 2.44 thousandths. So two inches, 440 thou. Uh, I'm measuring everything, like I said, in, in thou, because that's what my gauges kind of are. Uh, then I go ahead, I take my bore gauge that's properly set up. I go ahead and I just validate. Yeah, I like that. Perfect. So then I just go ahead and I add 6,000. So I go from, in my case, 40 all the way up to 46,000. So two inches, 446,000. And I go and I check and I see whether or not this guy fits in. And it doesn't. It doesn't fit in, folks. Does it fit in in this direction? Nope. And if I come over here on the bottom, nope, doesn't fit in. It looks like it kind of is, but look at how I'm not straight. Like I come in like this and it doesn't want to go in. If I go in perfectly straight the way it should, I cannot fit that in. And we'll do one last check over here. All right, so it doesn't fit in. So what that tells me is that right off the bat, we can stop what we're doing and say, all right, this piston and cylinder combo, even though they're a little bit worn, still is 100% usable. But we're gonna go and make sure, we're gonna do all of our measurements. So I'm gonna measure in my four locations. So what did we say? We said T1 front to back, T2 was side to side up at the top, then B1, B2. And we're going to write all that down in our piston category. That's just for one cylinder. We're going to, have to do the same thing for the other cylinder. So we're going to go ahead and do that. All right, so we basically have uh, almost a perfect piston. Uh, two inches, 434 thou uh, on all measurement except the B1 measurement, which is our bottom front and back, which is a little strange uh, given that I was expecting this one to be the one with the uh, thinnest outer diameter. Anyhow, that that's interesting. So uh, we also noticed that our piston is not oval, which is great. Now we're going to go ahead and measure our cylinder using our depth gauge or our bore gauge. Uh, by the way, like this, this tool seems pretty impressive possibly to you, but uh, you know, this is an antiquated tool. Uh, today, in, in today's day and age, they have digital ones with like prongs that automatically you just kind of put them in and they go cling and then they give you a measurement. You know, you see that in, you know, aircrafts and stuff like that, but those are I'm going to guess several thousands of dollars. This kit here, uh, although a brand name, uh, you could probably find used for probably around a hundred bucks, I'm assuming, and most probably new with like an import quality. Uh, that's probably just as good for who knows how much, 20, 30 bucks nowadays. You're always surprised at how cheap things are. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to measure this. All right, so I took my measurements and I put them on my table. Then I subtracted the piston dimension from the cylinder dimension, giving me my clearance. And as we can see, you know, it doesn't look like we've got it. However, if I average it out, we actually have 0 0.0075, I think. So we're slightly, you know what, we're, we're going to cancel. We, we're not going four decimal places. So guess what? We're not going to round it up. We're going to cancel it. You know what? Close enough, good enough for this guy. Now we're going to go ahead and do the exact same thing to piston and cylinder number two. 
Okay, so uh, I measured the second cylinder, the, uh, the front cylinder as I call it, and surprisingly, uh, the measurements are almost identical. Uh, when I look at the clearance, we have nine, eight, three, and eight thou for an average of 7 thou. So we'll say that realistically both of our piston cylinder clearances are 7 thou, which is 1 thou higher than I guess what the book says the limit would be. However, I do not have the machinist's touch. I mean, I'm not used to using these tools. I don't use them very often. Let's hope that I am imprecise by at least 1 thou in my measurements and that we're still okay uh, within the specs of this engine. We're gonna be reassembling the engine with these components, surprise, surprise, because I think they're in good enough shape to do that. All we're gonna do is remove the carbon from the top of the piston, the piston crown. Uh, we're not gonna be doing too much to the rest of it. There's not really any damage on the pistons themselves. When we look at the cylinder, we'll be honing both of them. Uh, this is the cylinder that did have the rough, uh, the rough pitting over here at the bottom. But I think as I stated in the previous video, uh, that area is really an area where the piston rings don't touch. You can kind of see the ridge where the piston rings have never gone. Uh, it's really just the skirt that gets in contact with that area. As long as we remove the roughness from it, even if there's a little bit of extra clearance over here, that yes, will allow the piston to maybe have a little bit of, a little bit of slop like this down at the bottom. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be that dramatic. So we're going to put that over here for now because coming up next, we're going to be ripping open that crankcase. But you guessed it, that's going to be for the next one. Hold on, hold on. Don't take off just yet. I want to show you two things. Uh, the first one, the next video is going to be the final teardown segment. We're going to be cracking open the crankcase, taking a look at the crankshaft. Spoiler alert, we are not doing all this for nothing. We find something major on that crankshaft. Uh, the second thing I wanna mention is my newest acquisition right over here. I just went to go pick it up. Uh, another 370 Rotax, and this is just a spare base. Uh, I picked it up basically so I'll have some spare parts. I know that there was a few things that were defective on my motor, and hopefully this guy is gonna have a couple components that are in better condition, and I can get away with taking the best parts out of this one combining it and maybe saving myself a little bit of time in terms of repairing. So if all that sounds good, I hope to see you on the next one. Maybe take a second if you're not already subscribed to do so, leave a comment, like, that's always much appreciated, and I'll see you on the next one. Signing out.